Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, no matter where you are, I hope you guys are well. Welcome to Architects Fast Forward webinar series. My name is Amelia, a Rapmasa representative, and I'll be your MC for today. Firstly, I'd like to thank Architects 2021 for giving Masa an opportunity to conduct this session. We are pleased to have this collaboration with Architects. I see some of our viewers are building material supply, suppliers, sorry, manufacturers or brands. If you want to discover the new way to connect and meet architects and specifiers in this new digital era, just click on the link that we have just posted in the comments. Now, for those who don't know what MASA is, I hope you can lend me your ear as I explain further. MASA stands for Malaysia Architecture Students Alliance and it is a non-profit student committee operating directly under Pertubahan Architect Malaysia, or in short, PEM, consisting of student representatives from all architecture institutes in Malaysia. It is a platform where Malaysian architecture students join forces to learn and share with appreciation of the past, generating sustainable living in the present and bringing unlimited possibilities to the future. Our mission is to develop an effective platform and network between Malaysian architecture students and professionals. We also serve as liaisons between students and PAM. Now, let us greet our special guests for today. We present to you once again, the chairman of PAM Education Committee, architect Adrianta Aziz and the one and only Mr. Phil Kim, who will be talking to us on the topic, dense places and scripted cities. To begin with, let us welcome architect Adrianta to say a few words. Right, Hi, architect. all right, all right. Hi, Emilia. Thank you so Hi, much architect. for your introduction. How are you? I'm good, architect. How about you? How are you? Good, good. Not too bad, not too bad. So thank you so much, Emilia. And on behalf of Pam, I can see yourself and your friends, Master Committee, have done a good job even though you are students so busy with your assignments, your submissions, you know, if this is a good exploration and good experience for you, especially that you can contribute yourself, your time in this platform. Thank you so much, Emilia. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Yeah, welcome everybody. We we'll see you again to Architects Fast Forward webinar series. Um, 12 August, year 2021. So thank you again to Architects Digital Platforms uh, for this platform. We call it Webinar Education Series supported by PAM and also from Acacia. So I can see that today is a beautiful day with a very interesting topic as myself that as an architect, urban designers and also a placemaker to have our speakers of all the way from Hong Kong, Mr. Phil Kim with this topic, Dance Places and Scripted Cities. So let me introduce Mr. Phil Kim. He's a board member, shareholder and managing director, Asia Pacific at the JERT Partnership Incorporation in Los Angeles and Hong Kong. So he focuses on JERT's constantly evolving place making ideas and coding of complex urban project that has impacted fast evolving cities and has helped rejuvenated Asia cities with the recognition of over 150 international design awards. Well, Mr. Phil Kim, he also advises private and public companies on innovations in mixed use design, retail, urban revitalization, vertical cities, and building social sustainability and the value of place. Leham Place, Hong Kong, Roppongi Hills, Tokyo, Queen's Wharf, Brisbane, and the Key Quarter, Sydney, are some of the past and present notable projects representative of a people-based design that draws over 1 billion visitors to judge projects around the world annually in 20 countries. So as a member and volunteer for the Urban Land Institute, Mr. Philkin is currently a global governing trustee, co-chair of the education program urban plan for Hong Kong and Asia, and a member of the Hong Kong Executive Council. Well, students, with this top title today, Dance Places and Scripted Cities, is an interesting topic 
that we would explore deconstructing uses, redefining the individual relationship to a place absorbing constant change and requiring reformulation of buildings and precincts. Well, defining a new uses defies shape and form ideas that have governed large scale work for 50 years in the most accelerated urban transformation in history. The next steps of urban cause involve physical and social coding to adapt to the habits and desire of inhabitants that demand emergent places. The blended cities reflect massive demographic change, demand responses from the design professionals that is future forward, data driven and programmed for vibrant human res response. The Commons Bangkok key quarter Sydney and projects will be used to illustrate this movement. So I can't wait to hear Mr. Phil Kim to share with us. So let's welcome Mr. Phil Kim. Hi, Phil. How are you? Hi, Adrian Tab. Thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here with you guys. Right. On behalf of Pam and also Masa, we are honored and, uh, you know, is thank you so much. I would love to say to you that you can spend time with us, share your experience, share your knowledge, especially for the Malaysian architecture student. And I believe around the world watching this as well on the Acacia platform. So without further ado, I pass it to you. Let's begin with your talk, Phil. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'll start with just a couple of very quick remarks because um, I've had the pleasure of uh, working in and around um, Malaysia for about a 15 year period. So, you know, maybe from a student perspective, you may not know them as well, uh, but some of the, the leading companies um, in Malaysia, um, such as EcoWorld and SP Setia and ENO, uh, have been uh, really loyal clients for, for a long period of time. And, and really what I'm about to say um, over the next, you know, 30 to 40 minutes uh, really tracks um, also the evolution of um, my conversations with them um, as they really begin to impact cities there. Um, but uh, Journey operates in about 20 countries annually, um, and we have the, the luxury in a way of learning from um, things that are happening um, in extreme places everywhere. Um, and uh, we try our best to try to localize uh, what we learn for each of the cities. So this is a, a bit of a reflection using a few case studies um, that hopefully uh, you, you get a sense of what is happening uh, within the cities. And of course, uh, as you study and move forward, um, uh, part of the idea that we have is that um, the, the uh, somewhat the traditions from Palladio and Le Corbusier and Miss Van Der Rohe to, to today, um, those, those are uh, part of the shape and form and, and uh, the history of architecture that, that we all participate in. Um, but from our perspective of how cities are evolving, uh, what we are exploring is more of an inside out relationship uh, to designing human experiences first and then finding out how to actually uh, put the form and structure in place uh, after, uh, especially because we're in such a, a critical and uh, adaptive time. Uh, but I, I do want to say, um, introduce one person just to come over because it's not just one person. There's a lot of us involved in our work. This is uh, Teresa Wan, who works with me in Hong Kong, and she's a senior architect for us who's been involved in a lot of projects around the re region as well. And so we've kind of designed this talk together. Okay, thanks. So um, what, what you're accustomed to seeing, and, and hopefully, um, you know, I'm a lot older than you guys are, but um, the, the traditions of, of how uh, different city structures and form uh, in, have informed the history of our civilization, that all matters. Um, and, you know, whether it's uh, something as iconic as the Manhattan grid uh, or, or the the uh, inflections that you see in older towns, you know, particularly the, the European ones, which are uh, a, a lot more idiosyncratic, uh, but have uh, retained its kind of form and, and interest over time. Um, so from a physical sense, that's how, how we have learned to program cities. Uh, but if you look at the image on the right, which is really a, um, a map showing uh, the tweets. Um, I, I, I think that the whole idea of uh, uh, digital and data analytics informing 
um, as much as uh, road systems and mass transit, uh, the way our cities evolve, um, uh, that's a part that you're all going to be participating in a lot more than, than somebody of my generation, although it's affecting me today. So if we could play the first video, it's just uh, just to get a sense of um, the speed of, of our cities. Um, and, and images um, uh, such as a crossing at Shibuya um, uh, really is indicative of uh, the dynamism of the region that we all live in, and work and study in. Um, and, and I think it's an amazing time. Um, it is truly the Asia century, and I, I, I've been um, living and operating out of Asia for um, over 20 years now. And although uh, I'm Korean-American, um, uh, uh, really, my the, the maturity of thought behind how uh, um, architecture and urban planning really works is has really been informed by um, the the rapid urbanization over the last uh, twenty to thirty years, um, and we're all participating in uh, a truly historical time, um, which is even further complicated not just because of COVID, but uh, because of this mix of technology and and old world. Where, where emergent uh, behavior and technologies and cities uh, have yet to be clearly defined. Um, and uh, I guess your opportunity really is that by the time you are practicing, um, you're the ones who probably will, as digital natives, uh, have the most intuitive sense of how all this is supposed to evolve. If we could play the next video also. Uh, we also uh, operate in a place where, because of mass transit, uh, the ability to urbanize at such a steep rate um, is done uh, relatively sustainably, uh, simply because our delivery system in terms of transport uh, is so highly efficient. So if we, if we could play just a few seconds of this next video, please. So, uh, you know, uh, my friends in North America um, don't actually know that there are um, such professions as, as pushers um, in a Tokyo uh, uh, railway station, but it's all for good cause. Uh, so the way we, we really look at um, cities um, has to be in a much more flexible and adaptive kind of way. And, and you look at um, uh, uh, various kind of metrics that, that traditionally for architects were not really utilized as fully as it actually should be. Um, populations, uh, the way that uh, it can work in cities like New York City or Manhattan during the daytime, and then uh, mass exodus uh, out to the suburbs is, is somewhat the traditional kind of behavior. Um, although, uh, again, in Asia, um, uh, metropolises, um, that relationship is much more integrated. We tend to live in urban cores a lot more than in uh, first world countries or Western countries. Um, the the uh, idea of adaptation, I think, is a really huge one. Where um, although we're we're always participating in sort of newer shaping and and form making, um, where technology and parametrics and and uh, uh, innovation uh, is so readily available, uh, when we begin to look at cities, uh, we're also equally fascinated by insertions of 
of uh, human behavior where things like uh, simple traditional markets that can be taken up and down and constantly adapt uh, in terms of its uses or offering to what human beings desire, um, it has as much equity as anything else. Um, our, our head office is in Los Angeles and, and it's a very strange city in a sense, um, but um, it's really a collection of uh, individual neighborhoods. Um, and this idea of neighborhoods, um, uh, the way they need to operate um, as a self-contained uh, community is a really important one, despite the uh, obvious uh, uh, downfall of, uh, of a sprawl uh, like in Los Angeles, where traditionally the usage of cars uh, it was the way to connect everything. Um, so it has, LA has a very poor mass transit system, it needs to really try to improve in order for it to continue to evolve. Um, although possible technologies such as uh, autonomous vehicles um, may provide uh, a solution for being, being able to link people together um, and, and where technology has some part of a solution. Um, cities like you know Kuala Lumpur, for instance, and Bangkok um, um, still have uh, and exhibit uh, these uh, uh, traditional ways of actually solving transport, uh, which uh, is an issue when people uh, have so much downtime um, uh, and an inability to optimize all of their, their the 24 uh, by 7 experience. So we have to figure out uh, different ways to try to resolve this. Um, the future of work, I think, is a really important one, especially coming out of COVID, where um, the idea of a third place has been discussed for probably two decades. Um, but third places in Asia, in particular, uh, because of lack of uh, public space in emerging market cities, uh, often was used in terms of um, a regional shopping center, for instance, where people kind of tend to gather in suburban neighborhoods. Uh, but within cities, um, the formal role of the office um, now is being completely re-examined. Uh, so urban core locations um, uh, are in great debate uh, about the future of the office. Um, generally, I would say with the cities that we're in discussions uh, with and, and core operators, uh, offices are not going away, but the nature of it has to adapt significantly since we now have to allow for flex time, the ability to work sometimes from home in third places as well as office. Um, and the role of office uh, really does change to create more conversations, um, higher value experiences and content generation. So the blended city is something that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Greg Clark, Professor Greg Clark in London has really championed, which is a, a complete immersion of the physical city with the virtual city. Um, and along with this um, is really this idea of a distributed network where uh, both in terms of uh, technology um, uh, and physical work, but also uh, via communications allow us to uh, look at all locations as uh, potentially viable one, uh, rather than, uh, again, urban core as primary and then everything else being secondary. Uh, the idea of change, um, and in this case, uh, purposeful change, uh, I think is a, a f another very important idea that's really come about. Um, again, um, uh, because of COVID conditions, the idea of being in safer conditions, uh, part of it has to do with really working with the ecology and organic conditions where where uh, outdoor, relatively good air, fresh air, uh, and the ability for people to meet in safer conditions uh, means that uh, the, there's a bigger movement uh, back towards occupying our public spaces. Um, the street is, is fundamentally one of the most important devices uh, uh, that's ever been created uh, and sometimes overly legislated, uh, but all over the world right now, people are trying to figure out uh, better ways of actually using it um, for uh, human experiences rather than, uh, in this case, what used to be a car park uh, or sometimes roads. You know, cities like Shanghai, for instance, um, you know, uh, are in an interesting position in that as uh, uh, wonderful as a city is, as it actually is, 25% uh, of all landmass in Shanghai is actually used for roads. Uh, and it, again, if we think about the way that transport works and the inefficiency of delivering one individual uh, via private cars, even with the a mass transit system there, uh, that's really not a sustain sustainable way um, uh, for uh, cities to use land in a purposeful um, and sustainable way. 
Um, we also have to look at um, uh, changes, and, and this is really pre-COVID, but COVID certainly has accelerated this. Um, uh, we're, we're, we look at a, a lot of different cities, and we've been working in Japan for uh, nearly 30 years. Um, and unlike um, the work that we did traditionally in cities like Tokyo and Osaka, um, when we look at some of the, the prefectures now, uh, it's, it's really much more uh, of an issue about lifestyle. Um, and uh, we are able to work really from anywhere, um, theoretically, especially if, if uh, main uh, government bodies and companies allow for the flexibility uh, for us to be able to contribute uh, uh, using technology. Um, so the idea of, of uh, being much closer to nature, um, uh, being in charge of uh, safe food production, uh, uh, having a blended lifestyle that is much healthier, um, and really using biophilic principles uh, to design a life uh, that is sustainable um, is really a primary driver for secondary and tertiary cities. So we, we uh, work with uh, some cities and some city mayors, and, and these are not uh, cities that you might be aware of, um, but um, it is providing another look and another future uh, for uh, uh, places in Japan which was really losing its population. And if you look at the demographics of Japan, it's been in a negative population decline for you know, close to 25 or 30 years, uh, where economies have essentially stopped other than the mega cities of Tokyo and Osaka. Um, but uh, when you look at these areas, uh, there's a, a definitely a movement from uh, especially the millennial classes uh, towards these cities where um, I, I think arguably the millennials have a better sense of overall global ethics and, and ideas of sustainability. Um, and they're willing to accept that they may not have the same kind of careers or have the desire to have those careers uh, uh, in exchange for a better life. Um, and that's giving um, cities like this uh, a real opportunity for formerly urban professionals to get into things like farming and cooking and hospitality. Okay. Um, so as part of um, our movement, um, you know, we have a, um, in Kawagyo in Japan, uh, uh, it, this idea has actually also affected the way we look at um, uh, government uh, centers. So uh, this relatively small project for us um, is a vertical government center, which is linked to uh, mass transit and train station, uh, but also walkable to the old town, um, where, where uh, interesting ideas about how to vertically separate different kind of functions. So there, there are uh, uh, specifically programmed uh, retail components to generate income, uh, but also clear and conscious public space uh, with government facilities um, that actually act as a municipal center. And along with that, uh, what's really important is, is uh, also along the, the primary trail to provide uh, walking routes that tie to mass transit stations. Uh, but also there's, there's a whole separate path for just for women to provide a more safe um, uh, environment for them. Um, so you, you're kind of seeing the linkages um, from uh, the, the site in the south to the urban core areas and, and the uh, idea of all, the, all these um, active uh, pathways. And so, you know, if we think about the way uh, that one might design a promenade within a project itself, uh, our work involves now uh, designing promenades that actually provide connective tissue through key neighborhoods and, and key transport hubs around these cities. Yeah, it's okay. You can skip this one. Uh, the, um, uh, the, with the idea of work, um, uh, we've been involved in a number of projects around the world where we're really, what we're trying to do is to break down uh, traditional and functional uses. Um, and again, uh, it's been way too long since I've been a student, so I don't know exactly whether uh, you're involved in this um, uh, from an academic perspective, but we're involved in challenging what we would call development briefs and programs. Um, so when a city, uh, you know, like in this case in Sydney, uh, says there's an office building and some shops and food and restaurants and other kind of functions, uh, what we do uh, first is not simply to, to begin to design to that in terms of traditional shape and form, but we begin to look at it uh, in terms of the future and whether that program 
uh, actually will uh, allow for the way human beings want to behave uh, and what they desire, and we can begin to challenge this. So this diagram is a simple section diagram, but what it does is to take uh, what used to be uh, a high street retail and f and offer and offices above and begin to mix program where, where things from the office get pushed down and um, uh, what used to be traditionally on the street level gets pushed up into this kind of mid-level zone. So the uh, in cities like Sydney, for instance, uh, we're working on uh, actually multiple projects, but uh, uh, this one that I wanted to show you um, is called uh, Key Quarter Sydney. It's under construction at the moment, and we provided a uh, master plan and a strategic planning and a way to think about uh, how to use this as a catalyst to regenerate everything from the Sydney Opera House to Circular Key to the rocks, um, and then to the three block redevelopment area uh, that's uh, under construction now. So it, it's the kind of uh, small circle um, uh, at the top the um, along the red. Uh, but uh, the way we were uh, thinking about it and programming it was as a series of interconnected precincts around the central core of Sydney. So everything you see from, from um, the, the, the top of this diagram down to the lower portion takes about a, it's about a 20 minute walk if you walked it really fast. Um, but what we wanted to do was to create uh, uh, a really a 24 hour city or you know to be factually correct in city an 18 hour city because uh, Sydney was really effectively a 12 hour city that went from uh, early morning to six o'clock. And the traditions of Sydney was that everyone would then go home to, to participate in, in other kind of life. Uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, acknowledge the, the changes to young professionals, migration from internationals coming into the city and create a desire to, to take advantage and program uh, more benefits um, that would allow people to congregate and hang out together in what is a really spectacular environment. So we started look by looking at um, uh, all of the individual areas around Circular Key, the sub-precincts, uh, and began more traditionally with a series of uh, more like landscape designs or environmental design to, to connect um, everything together. Uh, but um, what was really crucial in doing it was uh, we faced very quickly the, um, the obstacles of what traditional design would run into um, and began to attack it a different way, uh, which is really the diagrams on the, uh, the left-hand side. Um, so th those re really represent simple uh, program from uh, traditional ways of separating different functions from retail to living to F&B and uh, everything in between. Uh, to more of an activity-based working model, which begins to merge and mix everything together um, and blur the boundaries between primary functions. Um, and that really was really to be reflective of what we know in Asia, but which was a little bit different for, for Australia. Um, and then, I'm um, sorry, can we go back one? Um, and then uh, the idea of collaboration, meaning um, to break down individual moments for the way that somebody might come in uh, uh, into an office at six, seven, or eight o'clock in the morning, uh, coming in from the suburbs using the ferries or, or transit or driving or biking, which is really big in Sydney, um, and uh, everything that they actually do over the course of the day, and then, and then the individual activities that we wanted them to do uh, in the city rather than going back home or to the suburbs. Um, and looking at um, all of the primary uh, life of a neighborhood, all the individual functions, and begin to co-relate them in different ways. Um, and so the idea was, uh, was to create a kind of life way uh, that would begin to mix everything together and use soft experiences um, and an idea of coding experiences um, as the underlying factor to then design on top of it, a, a kind of carpet of uh, greenery, uh, and then refurbishment of some historical and heritage buildings, and then uh, reconstruction of uh, other offices uh, and, um, uh, and new construction as well on top to gain additional efficiency. So the, the programming diagrams were really crucial. Um, and you know again, it, it's, it's sort of odd to look at these now um, in, in this context of uh, living in cities like Hong Kong where uh, uh, life is so extremely vertical. Uh, 
but uh, you know, there's a number of different urban conditions that that everybody has to to try to understand. Um, so in this case, in in Australia, the idea of going beyond the ground plane for these public functions was. Uh, uh, was not something that they were actually accustomed to. So we worked very closely with the city to um, look at their plans for Sydney 2030 uh, and beyond, um, which was really designing a much more active economy around urban core areas and, and to make um, a more efficient use of the land itself and existing and new properties. So the idea was really to push uh, public life uh, up into the sky and then push semi-public um, life uh, and the functions of offices uh, down to these mid-levels uh, where, where uh, everything would begin to mix. Um, and one of the ways of actually doing that was was in a very, very detailed way to look at primary precincts um, and different uses, what we called style, from uh, work style to, to markets and food and music, uh, trading, education, living, um, and uh, public life. Uh, and what we did was basically uh, to look at the available um, uh, overall GFA, uh, both horizontally and vertically, and we began to program this. So that we, we created essentially a menu of experiences, uh, uh, which was uh, multiple ones where, where each one uh, looked a little bit different, depending on whether the emphasis was going to be on retail and FNV and entertainment, versus workplace, versus living and residence or culture. Um, and each one was uh, tested and examined uh, against uh, the intentions of the city to create this more public life uh, and an extended one into the later hours and weekends uh, versus the individual needs for the primary landowners and especially the, the, uh, the ones uh, operating in the office because that had the largest amount of area. So in doing so, um, we had to adapt and show different ways that the environments could be designed. So with this idea of blurring, uh, rather than having simple secured offices, even if it could be done nicely, like you know, instead of a traditional office, you could design it at like a boutique hotel, for instance, uh, we went a lot further to exploring this idea that um, the experience of uh, walking into the precinct to go into the office would be going through essentially a market hall. Um, and that really reflected um, the, um, the high degree of attention that Sydney ciders have towards great food and uh, wine, uh, uh, the amount of attention that they actually put to it um, uh, as uh, a real cultural reflection of who they are. Uh, and even looking at um, uh, upper levels of, uh, of this, which is uh, effectively uh, an early version of a co-work space that would begin to look down onto the, the market hall slash uh, office zone uh, entry experience, uh, and, and which began to then merge with uh, street level activities uh, with the idea that people could fluidly move up and down um, these areas uh, as part of the overall office experience. Um, and what you're seeing, particularly on, on the right, is um, uh, the competition image. Uh, for th so for, for the master plan, um, a great company called 3XN uh, won the design competition for the tower um, using um, the programming ideas. And, and they came up with a solution, which is a series of rotated stacked office precincts, three to four levels at a time with atrium spaces that would form um, uh, social spaces uh, up in the air and that would allow for adaptations as you move up the project, but also um, the synchronizing um, the, the function of conversations up in the air uh, down to these lower levels that we just explored. Um, so the image on the left is, is showing you one of the elevated uh, social hubs uh, that's up in the sky. Um, and the center image is, is actually not from the project, but something that we use very often where, where this idea of verticality is just incredibly important for, uh, for dense Asian cities. Um, one of the uh, uh, economic uh, uh, factors to really consider is that, um, um, I'll, I'll just put it to kind of a metric. Um, if, if an office space pays, uh, say, uh, $1, uh, retail and F&B tenants will pay 3 to $4. Um, 
So uh, of course you want as much higher paying um, and more socially active uh, spaces as possible, but there's a natural limit. And that's why generally, if you, if you look around KL, uh, retail tends to be say three to four levels and not much higher, uh, except in special occasions. Um, in cities like Hong Kong, um, you know, we've pushed that to up to 19 to 20 levels, uh, but we couldn't do it if everything was ground plane based uh, and moving up from ground up. Uh, it really does require this idea of integrated development or mixed use, where you have uh, essentially a captive population that's coming up from the sky uh, down to these lower levels. Uh, and now, instead of just thinking that uh, it's a podium and tower solution, we're really uh, mixing uh, these environments as you move up into the sky, including um, nearly to the tops as well. So uh, just recapitulating the section that we showed earlier, um, which is an illustrative section of, of um, essentially the life of the project as you move up from you know, um, bookstores and uh, bakeries, uh, garden lounges, rooftop lounges, uh, pool areas and co-work spaces all uh, co-mingling um, as, as what used to be simply called an office precinct. Um, and then just a quick image, um, which uh, 3XN1, um, um, with the view of the rotated towers that you see kind of on the right-hand side, looking uh, out towards Circular Quay and the harbor. If we could play the next video, please. So that, that, that video, um, I mean, to be very frank, is a project we lost. Um, so that was a, a paid design competition amongst a, a, a number of international firms for the Tencent campus in the Shanghai area of uh, Shenzhen. Um, it is under construction now, but we came in second place. Um, so very unfortunately, we didn't win. Um, but um, uh, the reason I wanted to show that was um, I, in my mind, I think that's one of the last uh, more traditional ways of looking at uh, workplaces and, and campuses. Um, and the reason is that it was uh, mandated uh, in the competition that it's very much a, a, a top-down look at the beauty of this peninsula site um, uh, in Shenzhen um, and really um, architecture as, as branding. And so I, I don't think the beauty of architecture will ever really go away. Uh, but the the nature of projects like that for us now, even just a year and a half later, uh, is that it's highly uh, uh, driven by user experiences and adaptability. Um, and I think that type of architecture, while it, it will not actually go away, you're going to begin to see a lot more ideas where you're marrying uh, modular construction and uh, idea of uh, sustainable materiality uh, with an ecosystem where, which tries to track changes much more rapidly because uh, the way that projects would sit relatively uh, in stasis for a decade or two decades, I think those days are long gone. Um, the, 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 so this idea of verticality and change also is reflected in, in different kinds of projects. So in the Mong Kok precinct of uh, Hong Kong, uh, we designed this project called Lang in Place. Probably a few of you have been there because it's a very youth-oriented project. Um, but um, it was to solve a specific thing because in um, um, a district of tenement housing, uh, which uh, nobody really thought could be uh, gentrified, uh, there was already um, uh, in progress a 60-story office building and a 700-room hotel next, on, on the next block. Um, so uh, uh, the developer had tried a number of different kind of solutions um, by the time we came in. Um, and, the, and what we did was to look at uh, those three individual components, the um, 
the uh, vibrancy uh, and the eclectic nature of the neighborhood. Um, and we designed a more of a retail and entertainment based solution that is vertical. So it's, this is a very, very small site. Um, and do we have, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so what, what you're seeing is uh, it's by, uh, the, the tower um, was designed by a local um, architecture firm called Wong, Al Young, Wong and Al Young. Um, and you're kind of, kind of just seeing the rooftop of our 15 level retail project. Uh, it's very, very small. Uh, the width of that block is only 44 meters. Um, and the length of the retail piece is only 65 meters. Um, so if you think about that as a kind of proportion and, you th and um, what a general, let's say, atrium and a retail solution does, if we put an atrium space in there, uh, we would only be left with about 25% of the footprint left, which would make it an unusable project. Uh, so we came up with a different idea for how to populate people over the 15 levels. Um, which also then uh, takes advantage of the fact that it's um, a block away from the MTR stations. Uh, and so we began by pulling people um, in the basement levels uh, 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 into the project and then up 13 levels of upgrade. So two below um, and 13 levels above. Uh, using uh, uh, kind of a, an idea of carving through this extremely dense block um, and what you're seeing kind of in the in the lower uh, cross section diagram is uh, is an uh, it, what looks like an atrium space, but originally it was actually just an, uh, a rooftop that was left over, uh, and uh, we worked with the city to be able to enclose that with the roof and capture it with the uh, glazed curtain walls on the side to create an elevated garden room at level four, uh, with the promise back to the city that it would be operating um, 24 seven. Um, and the key to all this is uh, the transport system. Um, the, the system is actually a, an upside down system where from ground level, taking these uh, long um, escalators, which move four levels at a time, uh, it takes uh, just under eight minutes to get from street level to the top of the project. Um, and where it says level 13 sky terrace, uh, that's the final uh, zone with this digital sky that's animated uh, above that. Um, and then from there, uh, the idea is that you essentially wander down back through the project just using natural gap gravity and these uh, very, very tight zones. Um, our inspiration programmatically was really a project called Shibuya 109 in Tokyo, uh, which has very little architectural merit, but a project that we love because um, it's a nine level project with small shops uh, with uh, uh, the idea that very young fashion designers um, would put up goods for one to two weeks at a time. Uh, and a lot of them only design um, and produce this in one shot. And the idea was really simple. Uh, and that was to take advantage of all the manufacturing that's available in uh, this part of Asia very cheaply uh, with the idea uh, that fashion and original goods would be there for a limited period of time and it would go away never to return. Um, and so it brings an intensely loyal group of people uh, back uh, all the time to this project in, in Tokyo. Um, and the top half of this project had the same concept, um, designed um, uh, with uh, two meter by two meter uh, modules for very young entrepreneurs uh, to come in and, and try to, um, uh, to uh, target uh, young professionals and, and kids in their teens. So it's really a project that's designed for very young people and you know, a lot of my friends, uh, mothers and grandmothers hate the project because they it scares them because of uh, sort of the extreme density and verticality of it. Uh, but it really wasn't designed for them. It really was very targeted for a select audience. Um, the top of it originally um, uh, was a skate park with a Vans shop. Um, uh, uh, it, and our, our owner at the time didn't believe that anybody uh, would actually go to it. So it was never... Uh, uh, never uh, executed this way. Um, the weakest part of the project uh, really is uh, is the top, and that's partially because of the mismatch uh, with now a series of restaurants um, rather than uh, something which targets very specifically the, the youth of this part of uh, Kowloon, Hong Kong. And so, uh, you know, I'm still kind of hopeful that eventually that they will put in the original solution. Uh, let's let's skip this because it's running. 
Um, the, the idea for, for us um, in all our projects is really to try to uh, create um, integration with mass transit. So TOD projects are incredibly important because um, it's really the uh, much more sustainable delivery system. Um, and this image from our project in Roppongi Hills, Tokyo, kind of looks at uh, how to integrate a, um, a, a 300 year old park uh, that's been restored with um, uh, the connections to the Roppongi Hill Station. Um, and, you know, referring back to the, the programmatic elements, uh, one of the things that, that's important for us to track is uh, the, the changes to demographics and what actually happens to a project. So the elevation that you're seeing here is actually part of a, a major luxury street. Um, but that project, we have it in the next one, right? Um, was actually changed uh, from uh, from women's fashion to uh, pets. Um, effectively, uh, pet stores, pet fashion, pet grooming. Um, and it's kind of funny transformation that we didn't really think about at the time, uh, which was a real lesson for us uh, to think about the changes to a city. Because if you, again, it's logical today that if you, if you go through um, uh, uh, the way that the Japan population has aged over the last 30 to 40 years, and they're one of the significant countries of the world that has been in negative population decline for a long period of time, um, you know, what actually happens? Um, so the, the economy for children's goods went down, um, and but the economy for pets and pet goods and pet experiences actually went up. So in one of the most luxurious projects uh, in all of Tokyo, uh, you have this pet street, which we never would have uh, predicted. Um, but had we known that, we would have actually created a better integration to the park itself um, so that it would be a more fluid uh, environment. Uh, and then I'm just going to kind of close uh, with uh, a project that is not ours, but one of my favorites. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you have been there if you travel to Bangkok. And it's a relatively small project called the Commons. Um, which is about 5,000 square meters uh, uh, over multiple levels. Um, and the distinction really is that, um, you know, it's in a pretty interesting neighborhood called Tonglor, uh, which has great uh, restaurants and bars and really fun to be around. Uh, but this isn't a back block, so it has uh, very poor accessibility. Um, I think there's a number of great lessons here um, that's important for for Malaysia as well. Um, this is a project that is completely de dedicated to food um, uh, and uh, all experiences related to food with a little bit of supporting retail. But primarily it's, it's uh, restaurants and street food um, that actually comes up from um, street level uh, up uh, about four levels of upgrade. Um, the cross section that you're seeing on the right is the most significant architectural move uh, because it is effectively the vertical circulation system and public theater that is actually combined. Um, so the way to wind up the project is also the seating for uh, live music and performances um, and, and also just to hang out uh, and eat outside. And it's very much an, a mixture of uh, indoor outdoor environments. Um, and programmatically, it's relatively simple. It has more street food down below. And then as you move up the project, it, it tends to get a little bit uh, higher end uh, with more formal restaurants at the top. Um, I, I, I think the most significant part of this is really what uh, 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 Kun Vichari and Kun Varat, um, they're a brother sister, uh, owner uh, and their journey, I think, is a, is a really interesting one to follow uh, because they started um, with a very simple idea to try to uh, create more of what they experienced as students in the U.S. Um, that they couldn't find back when they went went back to Thailand um, and began to practice. Um, so they they wanted to create. Um, this uh, sort of a casual informality, but in a, a slightly nicer setting. Um, and so they, they developed this property and then they, they ended up uh, drifting towards a total F&B kind of solution. Uh, I've been talking to them a lot over uh, COVID because they've opened up a second project um, and then now they're working on a third project. And I think what's really interesting um, what, uh, for what they're talking about um, is that they were really designing for communities um, and they feel that they're more like community owners rather than uh, just developers um, and, uh, and architects. So I think um, the idea that, that we really think about the people that we're serving in terms of designers um, is really a fundamental one 
uh, to learn. Um, and this as a kind of piece uh, to, uh, that can be adaptive for any kind of environment, um, you know, whether it's in an urban core situation or out in the suburbs is an important one to, to continue to follow, okay? Um, I think that's the, the last kind of um, project that I wanted to show you. Um, the, the, the main thing I think for, for us is, is um, I, I know that you, you must be looking at uh, the formal design of uh, architecture and, and planning. Um, uh, and we, uh, we have deep respect for that. And you know, it still occupies the majority of our time. Uh, but I think you have an opportunity to really look at uh, the, tr the trends um, and really think about the way that uh, your habits personally must have changed. Uh, the idea of, um, of uh, thinking about innovation and technology and really uh, uh, to think about more of an inside out process that will begin to um, reflect more of the habits of people and what what you are uh, wanting to experience also. So that's that's where I'm going to kind of end off and, I, and I'll look forward to having a, a discussion with uh, with you. Right. Very uh, interesting project, and I can tell you that it's uh, truly informative and it's truly inspiring, especially for the students who design urban designs or plannings, and especially for the architects' field. But I can tell you, urban designs uh, provides a context sensitivity approach, yeah, to planning and designing state uh, highways and other transport networks that the best the economics. Uh, environment, social, and also the uh, considered as an engineering requirements of an area. Yeah, so mm -hmm. using these multidisciplinary techniques contributes to the objective. So I believe that each project that you share with us today has a different constraint and a design outcome. Do you want to share with us the, what are the good urban design outcomes? Phil, um, I. I think our philosophy is really uh, almost overly simple. It's 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 not that easy to achieve, but um, I, I think the the fundamentals um, that's really largely forgotten is is um, we should be dealing with things like um, the measurement of happiness, for instance. I mean, I'm hundred percent sure that none of none of the architecture professors are using this as a fundamental basis for urban design or or architecture, um, but the the outcome um, must be beneficial to uh, individual persons and when when people begin to interact two people four eight uh, and sometimes uh, leading into crowds um, and i think the formality of, of infrastructure and planning and architecture uh, sometimes forgets that the overall intent is to provide shelter and comfort for for people um, and so for us uh, you know terms like um, activation and comfort uh, really are as much of a driver uh, for design as uh, you know a, a spine or, or or connections and and other kind of more more formal words so I think I think it's it's important to think about how simple uh, some of the reasons why we exist and why we do this work is uh, yeah. yet it's not really discussed sufficiently right right I think um Phil up uh, this is a very common question for for students you know they they, they say that urban design uh will be achieved by ensuring the needs yeah uh, for community and also natural environment and the built mm -hmm. environment they have to and to be considered in a creative way you know multidisciplinary way from the start or over the planning and design process so the, the an urban design outcome maybe might be an iconic yeah iconic so for your opinion does the urban design mean iconic Phil? uh yeah we, uh <laughs> yeah, yes um yes and no i i mean i um, you, you were kind enough to mention that we've won a few awards in our company's history right. uh but uh, of course we're an old company so you know it's you know that's that's averaging like three a year so it's not that many um but <laughs> but the reason that, that one tends to win awards is is that that iconic value um because uh the way that that things are judged sometimes is a, a little bit superficial i would say but it's a kind of snapshot yeah. into something so how how strong the imagery is uh, architecture as physical branding um, as representation for 
a whole slew of other things, of course, it's it's really incredibly important. Um, and and to a large extent, um, you know, as as an urban designer or ar ar architecture, that's the really fun part. You know, it's the the, the shaping yeah. and making it really glossy and looking. So, you know, I, I think I kind of somewhat avoided uh, overemphasizing that. Uh, but but you know, that doesn't go away, um, and and it still has to be or has to look beautiful or whatever inherent beauty. Uh, you can craft from from all the kind of conditions, um, but I think um, looking underneath that is, uh, of course, the the emphasis of what I was trying to say, which is uh, this forgotten side uh, where you know how how do you get to that sense of beauty? So I didn't show you this one project, but um, you know it's a, um, a, a eight level uh, a tilted park project that we did in Osaka on top of a, a train station. That's won all kinds of awards. Um, uh, and people look at it for its iconic value, and that's really what, what has given us a huge amount of credibility uh, from cities around Asia Pacific. Um, but um, wh what uh, others don't talk about um, are uh, the reasons why it is successful. Um, it isn't just because of the, the natural beauty. It's the fact that using uh, basic principles like um, you know um, passive uh, 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 sustainability uh, that we create a huge amount of human comfort there so it's like a, a one third or a cooler uh, on this project in the su on a summer day in osaka than one block away you know and so if you think about this idea of, of human comfort uh, that also uh, is equally as important as the beauty of the project because as beautiful as it can be uh, unless you you still believe in hermetically sealed interior indoor kind of projects um, uh, and especially coming out of COVID, where where you know our relationship, I think, to things that are organic is is much stronger now. Um, uh, it, it, these biophilic principles now really also begin to matter. So the the challenge to your students really is that you know they should be a lot smarter than we are, right? Um, so you know if we could only manage to design beautiful things on the outside. Uh, they'll be able to marry the two completely together and have greater reasons to create something which is beautiful on much stronger logic and foundation that that, that impacts uh, human beings a, a lot more closely. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I admire your statement just now when you're saying that it's about the, it's not only about beautiful, it's not only about safety and health, but it's about the human comfort there. You know, one of the projects that you share with us today that um, in Bangkok, I've been to that place, the common, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm experiencing a, a, a very interactive spaces with a thematics approach and so on. But would like to relate one of the questions from Facebook. Uh, the question is, uh, the place is so beautiful, uh, but he's concerned or he or she concerned about this, the stay, the staircase, yeah? Looks seamless. Yes. What were the safety issues that you had to tackle in this design? I mean, the safety, especially we saw the staircase. I've been there before. I mean, it's not, but we're thinking about the safety and also about universal design as well. So, mm. can you respond for that, Phil? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, the reason I really admire that project is that it, it not that it's not that it's perfect, and, and really the, the the brother and sister who own it. You know, yeah. really are very open about all the mistakes that they they actually made. Um, but what they've been able to do is adapt very very quickly. Um, you know, whereas I think the the way that we were we were trained, and and I think you too, um, when once you 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 uh, design something and you put it into place, change is extremely difficult. Um, and so, uh, e even if something does not work, uh, uh, one simply lives with the inadequacies uh, of a solution for a very long period of time. And I think what the Commons um, does is, is that it's not. I think it's. I think it's a very pleasing looking project, certainly, um, but it's it's not incredibly precious. So that I, I think their ability to constantly tweak and adapt to to conditions. Um, will be far greater. And that means a much more relevant and sustainable project. Uh, because what we traditionally used to deal with is that you know, every uh, eight to 10 years, um, an owner would go in and have to redo significant parts of the project. Um, and particularly when it's more retail oriented, which is always yeah. changing, uh, that was much yeah. more the case. Um, but you know, if we take the principle that I think that, that they have done uh, where uh, change, maybe it's not change, it's evolution, that that, uh, that a project is not fixed, 
but it's always being worked on. It's very organic and it's almost like a living animal um, yeah. that, that, that continues to adapt to the conditions. And I think that's, that's the promise of a, a project like that. It's about flexibility, I suppose, yeah? I mean, this is the up-to-date question, the up-to-date concern about when you, would this design still can be generally acceptable during the pandemic situation? Since the vertical buildings, uh, how limited people can use per time, especially talking about the social distancing implementation, yeah. and dense area are more prone to issues related to the spreading of virus. So what's, what's your say about this? Yeah, um, I see that. Yeah, I see that question from Jason. Yeah, that's a, it's yeah. an excellent question because um, uh, we are dealing with it. Um, so, yeah, especially in cities like um, Hong Kong, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was a, a very, very serious question. Uh, would anybody want to go back to the office, for instance, um, or uh, these kind of uh, 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 narrow, tall buildings? Uh, would they really have a place because people felt so, so kind of unsafe? Uh, but I think a couple things have happened um, uh, in Hong Kong, um, which is uh, clearly, uh, e even though people can work from home or possibly study from home, uh, the need and the desire for people, the human beings to connect, um, maybe at a much higher level or more qualitative level, uh, that's been uh, generally uh, uh, confirmed by almost everybody. So maybe not in terms of the frequency, but definitely the desire is actually there. Uh, so, so urban core areas in particular, I think will have continue to have huge amounts of value simply because there's also other things associated with it. Um, you know, uh, great, great shops and, and uh, bars and culture and, and everything else. And so that, that idea of mixing uh, within a city area is, is actually there. Uh, what, uh, what has changed is, is really the nature of space, I think, um, where um, you know, if we again, if we take the the idea of an office, um, you know, we went from uh, traditional offices to cubicles to open plan and flex yeah. and hot desking. Um, and right now, and and this is uh, still to be uh, borne out, uh, it's sort of going back to this idea that mm, there's a need for an office, uh, some for safety reasons, but two for the productivity of work, where you actually need uh, some some silence and ability to focus. But then you also need this engaged social time where, where people are kind of uh, conversing. So the, the mathematics is tends to be that generally people still need um, nearly as much office, uh, but for different kind of functions uh, for better and better experiences. So we're, we are talking about people still congregating, but at a greater distance in terms of the normal kind of work. So it's going to look a little bit different, but but not the locations um, and not the desire to 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 connect. And then in terms of the the direct question that uh, Jason is asking, uh, even within the vertical projects that we're actually doing now, instead of uh, uh, the simple curtain walls with everything um, central uh, air conditioning, um, we're really looking now uh, in terms of facades that are operable and open that allow. Uh, uh, air movements through. Um, and this is a, I mean, for, for Malaysians, um, you know, it should be a really simple thing. Ken Yang has been talking about this for 30 years, um, and he's probably not at all popular anymore, uh, but he was right, right? In, in, in the sense that, <laughs> sense that, that um, uh, you know, whether it's a, a, a tall vertical building or not, um, I think the fundamentals of how buildings uh, and environment engage um, e each other is still the same, and 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 maybe now we're finally over that period where everything has to be, you know, Hong Kong is really extreme, like you know, 20 degrees inside temperature, yeah. um, and much closer to what Japan does, which is kind of warm AC and uh, openable and operable and getting fresh air through. Yeah, yeah, precisely. I mean, to relate that that respond, yeah, there's a questions from Rin Wong. What are the key or fundamental or even philosophy to achieve the simplicity urban design in details that we should take note of? The simple, sorry, could you repeat the question? I, I... Okay, I repeat the question. The, the question is from Rin Wong. Yeah? What are the key or fundamental or philosophy to achieve the simplicity urban design in details that we should take note of? Um, yeah, yeah. If I if I if I understand the uh, question 
Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of a bad case. Um, and that is essentially like uh, uh, town planning principles in Hong Kong. Um, yeah. the, the success of a city like Hong Kong actually meant that um, uh, planning regulations that, that was always inadequate was reinforced and continued to be re reinforced because economically, uh, Hong Kong has been an extremely successful city for in, in virtually nonstop for 40 to 50 straight kind of years. Right. So right. people may do. Um, I, I think it's, it's frankly wrong. Um, um, and fundamentally, uh, what, it, what will inhibit Hong Kong's growth into the future is uh, its lack of balance, um, mm -hmm. its lack of uh, public space, um, the, the, the extreme stresses that a city like this uh, has to endure. Um, and so, you know, um, the, the urban acupuncture is a term that's been used for a long period of time. But, you know, if, uh, if uh, the planning laws need to be changed, it's to allow for, you know, literal and metaphorical breathability uh, within these kind of er, uh, very dense kind of um, cities. So, um, you know, obviously um, there are practitioners um, who really should be studied in great detail. Um, and I think mm -hmm. like, for instance, we, we do it more from an organic process, but the ones who would really be well known are like, let's say Gell Architects, right? So Jan Gell's been out there for, uh, you know, since the, the 1970s really talking about this where where um, the way to, to design or, or the way to urban design um, is really to think about fundamental human factors um, and try to understand what creates comfort and, and happiness and then build yeah. rules on top of that. Um, and so uh, a, a, few, a few people um, like that are able to go into cities and actually begin to uh, essentially uh, create a surgical process to allow for recommendations to deconstruct this. Um, but, but if we could start fresh from a series of guidelines that actually starts from this humanistic level, then of course you're gonna have a much better chance. Uh, as you know, most of our cities have not been designed this way. Um, urban design, uh, it, actually even just to say urban design, um, there are very few guidelines that cities actually use uh, in order yeah. to design cities. So, so planning, building uses um, have, uh, or transport or infrastructure has largely been what has been used to uh, to uh, uh, divide up and parcel our cities, but we're in a process where we have to reverse that process. Um, I do have to say the, um, a couple of cities I admire deeply in terms of their consciousness for this is um, Sydney and Melbourne. I think in particular, um, you know, because I, I, I know I have so many Malaysian friends who went to yeah. university there. Um, there are cities that, that really for the last two decades have really begun to codify this, the language of urban design on human terms um, uh, and, and really are diving into it. Um, and so the nomenclature for, to talk about urban design, I think it's, uh, it's really best uh, in those cities in particular. And, and uh, I also have a lot to learn from, from them. Precisely, precisely. It's when you mention about the programmatic precinct in one of your slides, a question from Guma Sylvester, one of the Massa committee members. Mm -hmm. If were to say these pieces are more intertwined with each other rather than being planned in different parcels, would this be a better in terms of urban planning design, Phil? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna. I'm, I, I will. Um, steal this term from Guma uh, for uh, future conversations with my, <laughs> my clients to say intertwine. Yeah. Uh, I, I usually use the term uh, blurred or blurring. Um, uh, uh, and I think we're, we're kind of relating the same kind of issues because the, the, the idea is, is not to be fixed in terms of its uses. And part of it is that just, you know, uh, again, referring back to COVID, but also, you know, if you think about, you know, the, the students um, at MASA versus uh, like when I went to school and then everything in between, uh, all of our habits have changed over a long period of time. Uh, most of our yeah. projects, these, these large projects take, you know, five to seven years uh, from inception to completion. And, you know, that's half a decade or more where a huge amount of change is occurring faster and faster. So the, the, the needs as defined at the beginning of a project uh, can be uh, uh, outdated by the, by the time it's actually completed. Uh, and with mm -hmm. the older ideas, it's very difficult to continue to adapt that. So the, the simple approach that we're actually taking uh, and really challenging um, 
uh, our clients um, on and cities is uh, simply to say, well, we, we understand that there may be four or five key functions, but to allocate yeah. specific kind of space, volume, or or um, uh, connectedness uh, has to be far more adaptable. Um, and so, you know, if we simply take the approach that it's, um, let's say, uh, in the extreme, uh, it's a volume of spaces, and within that, using um, prefabrication technology and uh, better materials and more sustainable materials, uh, we could be slotting in different kind of uses and changing yep. it out as those those needs actually also begin to adapt. So, you know, there's a project on the Gold Coast uh, where, um, with uh, with Australia and the extremely high uh, requirement for car parks. Uh, which makes no sense in the long term, but in the current Australian standard uh, is required. Uh, what we have been working on and advising is that we we build car parks with um, not uh, at let's say you know 2.8 or 3 meters floor to floor, but we build them at 6 meters floor to floor, and then we put in a, a metal pan in the middle that can be used as a car park for the next say five years. Um, our, our guess. Um, um, uh, is to be optimistic to, to say that uh, between uh, increases in mass transit um, and the way that um, uh, AV is working, where where Uber and Lyft and all these kind of technologies will allow people and car ownership to go down, um, that those car parks with, with the double volume spaces can then truly be adapted for other kinds of uses without having to uh, uh, deconstruct and rebuild, uh, since concrete itself has um, such an adverse impact on on uh, carbon embedded carbon and carbon emissions. Right, right. There's another question, quite challenging question here, Phil. Mm. So, in relation with the current pandemic, will there be a huge shift towards the way or even policy of urban planning, especially when densification has becoming bad perception? among publics, although it's one of the many main aspects that contribute towards the development of urban city? Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, that's a challenging question. It's, um, it's, a, it's a big debate right now because I think uh, right. there's various points of view that can support uh, either end of the argument. Um, uh, th there are cities, um, uh, especially in Asia, where mass transit tends to be more efficient, where um, existing urban core areas um, it will require adaptation, but because it's already there and because there's already an efficient population and means of uh, delivery, uh, then we then we should be in the idea of, or the mode of um, adopting uh, rather rather right. than continuing to build out. Um, uh, cities um, within secondary locations, I think um, it's logical to think that uh, we shouldn't be overbuilding and, uh, and over densifying anymore for safety reasons and, and other reasons. Um, but it really will require something else um, as well, because um, if you want to, to go to more of a satellite center that's within walking distance or, you know, five, 10 minute um, uh, mass transit commute, I think that's a wonderful kind of idea. But a lot of cities, and I would argue um, KL um, has a real challenge, for instance, where people still are gonna be hopping into their cars. Um, yeah. and, and, and having to drive. Um, and so, so from a total uh, environmental design perspective uh, of a region or a metropolis, um, mm. it's, it's, it's solving one problem, but creating other problems. Um, and so I think um, the, the, the holistic strategy really needs to be thought through uh, before it can really be resolved. Um, I, I'm, I'm personally um, uh, changing my mind a bit because I'm definitely a believer <laughs> in um, in urban core areas and all the vitality that it actually gives, um, but I do I do see um, the benefits of uh, being able to uh, live in more affordable areas or in quieter areas or more green areas and still being able to find productive work. Um, you know, so I I think it's a kind of blended strategy that will win out in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is one of the, my last question to you. I mean, this is my personal question. I love to to hear from you because I'm also teaching urban design to the students, master students, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they need to, to see the projection here, you know, in order to influence the physical design direction of a project. Uh, mm -hmm. Urban design must be addressed in the early planning stages, you know, as an urban design approach has the 
I can consider as the greatest influence and it could be highly cost effective when applied in the planning stages of a project. So mm. it must be a continued through all subsequent stages of design and then finally monitored so that the de desired outcomes uh, will be delivered. So I want to hear from you so that you can share to all the students here, when should urban design to be considered based on your experience here now? Um, uh, right now. I mean, as 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 early as possible, uh, because I, I think everything else kind of comes um, second in a way. And and I guess um, the, the ur urban design, uh, there's a formality to that as well. It's it's yeah. not all all sort of the soft arts, but I think what we're talking about is a more holistic way of thinking about um, about design to factor in in um, essentially user experience. Um, yeah. And I think that the creating essentially a, a vision for the type of community that you desire really has to come first. Then, mm. then the elements uh, that begin to match um, essentially pre precinct desires um, that's more environmentally driven uh, to this yep. idea of what the community wants comes um, second. Uh, and then the formalism really comes third and then planning on top of that. Um, it's a kind of reverse order because you know, yeah. traditionally that human element is what we end up with last and we try to adapt. And of course, we're all very uh, adaptive creatures, but but you, you, we're already dealing uh, with a stack deck that goes against it. Um, I, I, there's a, I would love to do a program for your students sometime, uh, which is what yeah. I do in Hong Kong uh, high schools and universities called Urban Plan. Um, in Singapore, we do it for public officials. Um, and I think it's the right, right model um, and we're, we we do it in order for uh, all these um, uh, highly stressed uh, high school students who are, are very uh, test taking oriented trying to get into good universities uh, and give them an opportunity to learn in an interactive way but the idea is very simple it's a neighborhood building exercise and, and it's right. really how to design a resilient neighborhood from uh, we have a director of uh, financial pl finance planning uh, sustainability, uh, community engagement, and client liaison, um, and teams of five students actually work together to design four city blocks with context. Um, mm. And so, when when you see that approach, what actually happens is that all stakeholders have to be respected, uh, and each uh, person playing a role has to have an equal amount of uh, authorship over the final scheme. So there is there is architecture and, and urban design. Uh, but it's not weighed or judged any more highly than uh, the response to community letters and senior citizens and uh, people who want uh, community engagement. And so I think I think that's more the approach that I see as being the future of urban design. Right, right. That's, I mean, there's a good insight. I mean, there's a good sharing that, you know, you know, people ask me, people ask the students, you know, this, this keep thinking but in Kuala Lumpur, it's different approach because they've been somehow how does the project team relate to urban design? They keep asking it. So as urban design uh, is a holistic approach to development. It must be fully embrace the skill of relevant professionals. And this include uh, planners and also environmental managers who, who set the broad uh, framework, architects, civil engineers, mm -hmm. or maybe even landscape architect, who even shape the project into the coherent design like ecologies, uh, traffic impact assessment experts, noise consultant, ecologists, or even the heritage consultant, even other experts to advise on designs field. So yeah. we're going to end up our, our session here. Is there any final words from you, Phil? I am so honored to hear to hear from, from your sharing input here. And then I love to, to keep in touch with you back, you know, to call you maybe for other universities event program. So any final word from you, Phil? No, um, yeah, please, please stay in touch. Um, um, as I said, it, it's been kind of an honor. Um, I'm usually completely terrified uh, speaking to students because I, I, I just figure that they're, they're the most open-minded and, and critical. So you know, after you've been practicing for a long period of time, uh, I think one does kind of tend to forget um, some of the, the raw inspiration that, that somebody with a completely open mind and approach uh, and fresh experiences actually bring to, you know, uh, our respective fields. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful time for particularly uh, uh, digital natives to take 
what they just know intuitively um, and can access and resource in such a, a speedy and, and quick kind of way um, and to to bring to all these complicated problems that that um, probably my generation created right so we created 30 40 50 years of success but um, those foundations uh, as it uh, turns out um, has a real frailty to it so it doesn't mean that we're going to uh, uh, destroy and redo our cities um, but uh, I think there's so many different um, uh, elements of inspiration and technology and insight and culture and um, um, physiology and, and behavior science that we can bring yeah. to bear that our entire profession is going to look very, very different in, in 10 years, certainly, uh, and possibly sooner, but certainly in 10 years. And I think that's, that's what um, all the students of MASA have an opportunity to do and they should find it completely open and interesting and whatever people like us may put as barriers as you you know if you complete your university studies don't don't listen to any of us i mean you know <laughs> these these barriers are artificial uh and we need better solutions from smarter people and, and newer and younger generations Thank you so much, Phil. I mean, uh, I personally, as a urban designer as well, a placemaker and also an architect, I'm also inspired your your knowledge, your experience sharing your projects. And thank you again on behalf of PAM and also uh, MASA, Malaysian Architecture Student Alliance, that we are so honored to have you today and really grateful to have your contribution of your time and your, your knowledge. And I would like to take opportunity to say thank you to Dr. Tan Peying, our PAM past president as well. She's the one who connects, yes. connecting us, you know what I mean? So really hope to see you in future. I mean, most welcome to Kuala Lumpur after all this pandemic situation is over, hopefully. So for all the students, uh, today we have a, a very great information, great sharing, great knowledge to be shared. So I hope that you all inspired by our Mr. Phil Kim. Remember this, whatever good things that we build end up building us. So best way to change future is to design it. Design is not the solution. It is the elimination of the problem. So with that, Phil, I hope to see you again. We keep in touch and I pass back to Emilia, our MC today. Be well. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Architect Atrianza. And thank you, Mr. Phil, for giving us an interesting and eye-opening sharing, as well as giving us very useful advice, especially for us students and young architects. All right. So this marks the end of our talk today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on today's online sharing session. And thank you so much to our very special guest, Mr. Phil, once again, for sharing your experiences with us. We hope everyone really enjoyed it and gained a lot of knowledge. Also, again, a very big thank you to Architect Adrianza for being the moderator. And last but not least, I would like to thank PAM and Architects for giving us the opportunity to have this collaboration in Architects Online Fast Forward 2021. Do keep in touch and follow us on MASA's Instagram and Facebook page for more updates and do check out Architects Online for more interesting webinar sessions. Also, if you haven't already done it yet for the students, you can register for PAM membership at www.mypam.org.my. There are a lot of benefits for architecture students that await. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll catch you next time. Have a good day and goodbye. Be well. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.